And I'm very glad to welcome you again to one that we've been having during the last months to showcase how Mexican uh, academics, uh, scientists, and cultural artists uh, are uh, doing and contributing to the science and knowledge in New England. And today we have a very interesting topic with a fantastic guest, teaching and showcasing Mexican pre-Hispanic and colonial art in New England. And our guest is Eulogio Guzman, who is a teacher in, in the correct title is Chair of the Visual and Material Studies Department at Tufts University. Thank you, Eulogio, Eulogio for joining us today. Thank you much um, to you, Alberto, for this wonderful invitation. I, I'm uh, thrilled to be joining you this afternoon. Great. Dr. Guzman earned a BA on architecture and holds postgraduate studies in the fields of anthropology, history, and art history in Latin America. He specializes on the sculpture and architecture of the Mexica people in pre-Hispanic Mexico and the socio-political history and visual art of colonial Mexico. He also has wide experience with museography and exhibit curation, having collaborated with local museums in Mexico and LACMA and in LA. He is a senior lecturer and chair of the Visual and Material Studies Department at Tufts University, as I have just mentioned. So thanks, Eulogio, for, for being with here with us today. We have Barbara del Castillo, is my colleague from the consulate, who helped me prepare the questions for you, and she's joining us in this conversation. Terrific. Great. So you have a, a very interesting career which spans across a number of disciplines. How, do you, how did you decide to pursue these different interests, and how did they bring you to Boston? Yeah, um, well, you know, interestingly enough, they grew, um, the, the interest grew up as, the, as a child, uh, really. My mother um, led me to travel um, to many different archaeological sites, such as Teotihuacan, Palenque, Uxmal, and Chichen Itza, at a very early, you know, by the time I was 14. But um, formally, it started when um, I entered college at UCLA, and my first two years, I took a number of courses uh, from uh, Henry Nicholson, who was the... Um, a very prominent scholar in studies of uh, Mexica's culture, I mean, Mexica um, culture. Um, and I took um, two classes with him in a seminar on my epigraphy. At the end of that, the first two years, I um, actually ended up going on an archaeological excavation um, and, in Belize. And um, it was there that I ended up actually working on a, an architectural reconstruction of a Maya household which actually got published and, and that was really, really amazing. In high school, I had taken some um, architectural classes, uh, architectural drafting classes, but um, it was actually um, in direct conversation with Nicholson that he suggested that I might actually want to get an architecture degree because then that would make me more of a novelty in anthropology or in archeology. span um, And so I did I actually went to the Southern California Institute of Architecture and, and got a five-year architectural degree um, and then while I was doing that, I spent um, 10 years working as a California archaeologist in California, working for the Department of Forestry and for the, um, the U.S. Department of Forestry and the California Department of Forestry. Um, then um, when I, uh, you know, graduated from, uh, from uh, SIARC, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, um, um, I came out right at the recession in 1990. And so as a result, um, it ended my brilliant architectural career within a matter of years. And at that point, it was when I applied to the U uh, master's at UCLA um, Latin American Studies Department. Um, I ended up writing three um, thesis projects. One was on the open air chapels of Mexico, 16th century Mexico for James Lockhart. It's a historian, prominent historian, really incredible person who really shaped me in many ways. Um, another um, one on, on the analysis on an, and analysis of urban development at Teotihuacan um, for Richard Leventhal um, in, in anthropology. And the third was actually a thesis that examined um, the, the presence, the repeated presence of the frontal facing gods 
frontal facing figure in Andean art for Cecilia Klein in art history. Um, and then from there, finally, after doing that, I, I then went right into, um, and actually I, I was able to finish the masters very quickly in, in four semesters, four, four trimesters, I guess it is, four quarters. And then um, I applied to art history um, at UCLA for a PhD, and I ended up writing a dissertation that was entitled Sculpturing, Sculpting Imperialism, the Diverse Expressions of Local Cults and Corporate Identity in the Two Tested Figure at the Templo Mayor, um, which centered on exploring the ways in which sculptures were used in conjunction with architecture as political weapons by the Mexica to advance their expansionistic dreams of empire. So that was, uh, that put me at 2002, where I was, a, I was my status was ABD, all, all but dissertation. And I applied and was secured and ended up getting a job, um, a lecture position at the Museum School for Tufts University. And this is where I've been teaching classes on pre-Columbian and colonial art and architectural history of, of uh, Peru and Mexico since, since then, almost 20 years, 18 years now. So that's... So from California to Boston, that was like a, a, a big yeah. jump. Right, it was. It was and, and it was a difficult jump, mostly because, um, of course, the, I was actually all the time going back and forth between Mexico City in Los Angeles, and the, the real difficult decision was to actually, you know, moving to Boston, <laughs> there was no direct flight from Mexico City here. I normally spend anywhere between six weeks to, you know, two months in Mexico City, if not longer, the more I, I can stay, the better. So I'm, I'm fully bicultural. Um, and being here, the decision to come to Boston was a major one precisely because of the proximity or lack of proximity to Mexico. Um, it, 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 as a result, now I go Boston, Mexico, Boston, Mexico repeatedly with only a short, you know, visit to Los Angeles a couple of times a year, if that, so. And did you grow up in Mexico or always in, in, in California? No, I did. Well, I always joke that <laughs> I was born in Mexico City North, and that is Los Angeles. So um, when I was two years old, my parents moved back to Mexico City, and that was actually in 1968, believe it or not. We moved in September of 1968. So two, um, you know, was it four weeks, five weeks before the, the, uh, the massacre at Loco. So I grew up in Mexico City from 1968 through 1976, um, repeatedly come making visits then from Mexico to Los Angeles because part of my family was also there. Um, but, um, you know, um, Alfonso Cuaron's Roma was precisely a, a, about all about my infancy. So every moment of that film, just I relish every part of it, um, just because it, it just reminded me so much of that, you know, of the one. Likewise. But, pardon? Yeah. yeah. Likewise. Oh, yes. I imagine. It, yes. it, it also made me remember. I, I grew up with Alfonso. He, he's kind of like my cousin. So all, okay. all, most of the characters of that film, I, I, I know very well. But, but that's another conversation. Barbara, do you want to jump in, please? <laughs> I do. This is incredible conversation. Um, Professor Guzman, in your academic work, you, if, if I'm understanding correctly, you establish a relationship between politics or the political order and architecture and culture in the Mexica Empire. Is, this is something that you normally spent months teaching at a, a regular semester, but could you briefly describe this interaction for us? How did it take place then and why was it so important at the time? Oh, absolutely, and continues to be. But so my interest in politics grew by focusing on the physical evidence I analyzed at the Temple Mayor offerings in, in Mexico. I was lucky and, and really, um, um, very, very um, I'm blessed that um, I met Eduardo Matos Moctezuma when he came to give a lecture at um, UCLA and that my advisor, Cecilia Klein, had a very wonderful relationship with one of his um, premier students. At that time, he was just kind of making his rank. I mean, he was already, you know, sort of a wunderkind of sorts, Leonardo Lopez Luján. And we went down and um, the first visit that we paid him was when he was excavating the Nuclantecutlis, those two spectacular figures, yeah, that he had only kind of um, revealed the, the claws and the head. And so that was, yeah, that was something that was incredible. And so um, as a result of that, I was able to um, 
uh, request and, and got a chance to do my, my research um, on the Temple Mayor. Um, I, there was that I, I became very focused on reading the deposits um, that were in the Temple Mayor offerings uh, that were made throughout the continuous growth of the Temple Mayor as social transactions, that is to say that they recorded political exchanges between those offerings, giving the offerings, um, mostly outside of the center, and just receiving them, um, which contained then a number of, of, of ritual items. Um, within that, the, the principal items um, were a sculpture, stone sculpture, that was repeatedly shown in the offerings, um, in, in it, which was related to the actual growth of the Templo Mayor. That is to say that the sculptures show up um, in every phase, starting with um, the phase that is associated with the imperial growth of empire. Um, the, the, the sculpture took the shape or the form of a, of a compactly seated individual um, and who had a, a variety of stylistic and iconographic themes um, that were sculpted in a number of primary materials. Uh, my analysis of these sculptures showed that their placement within associated deposits uh, seems to have symbolically consecrated social bonds between the actual donors, those that were giving the objects, and those that were receiving it, that is to say, the Mexica Center, the, the overlords. And these figures um, were very distinctive, interestingly enough, headdress, which had these um, elements, circles, chalchiwis, along with a, um, two protrusions, two essentially horns, that came from the, the top and um, uh, it was interesting because the most scholars interpreted those as fire sticks. And so they associated this figure with the god of fire, Chutikutli, um, and tied its presence to um, the religious precepts associated with fire and centrality, emphasizing the idea of a cosmogonic, cosmological kind of interpretation. My interest was uh, in, in trying to figure out if the stylistic, the many different stylistic representations gave any clues about the political expansion of empire. And because I had the, you know, the archaeological phases of construction, which allowed me to see essentially various different historical periods of time, um, it, it, I thought it, was, it would be um, a real opportunity to try and see how stylistic changes might actually overlap with historical, with the historical kind of uh, moments that we knew very clearly in, in, for the Mexica. Um, I, I actually um, argued and in the dissertation and later publications that the two protrusions that were actually on the top of the head, which I actually called tufts, and this was before I got the job at, at the university. <laughs> maybe that's why you got it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. But those two tufts actually were references to the two shrines that were on top and are found on top of the Templo Mayor. And so that the actual, I read the figure as an actual manifestation of the Temple Mayor itself. Um, and that, you know, the, that the compact body of the sculptures were um, basically visually recalled the actual temple itself, um, where a lot of, um, uh, where a lot of social contracts or a lot of political kind of fortunes were, you know, social covenants between the Mexica and the periphery. Uh, were repeatedly made and renewed with every construction phase. Um, right now I'm working on a book that looks at the patterns that I identified within the two tufted figures in relationship to larger patterns in the art of the Mexica um, to see how to really explore the ways in which they developed in international sound, international meaning in Mesoamerica um, that incorporated a wide variety of, of you know, styles from all different other cultures, which of course facilitated their political growth. I think this is important because it really establishes the Mexica as premier politicians. And um, they, it clearly shows that the Mexica used art as part of their statecraft, um, and that they used it as a means of materializing the political, political ambitions, which I think is, is, is um, really exciting to, to, to see these you know, ancient cultures in this level. Beyond just, you know, the amazing ways by which both Leonardo Lopez Lujan and then also Eduardo Matos Moctezuma and a variety of many other archaeologists and scholars have, have really shown the impressive kind of spiritual and, and, and kind of cosmological legacy of the building itself. So I wanted to kind of complement some of that. So what you just said would mean that other cultures wouldn't do the same, wouldn't use the same kind of, uh, of expression? <laughs> 
Not, not entirely, because of course, the Mexica are the first true kind of empire. I mean, like for instance, there's an argument that possibly Teotihuacan might have, you know, also been an empire. There's a lot of arguments uh, as to uh, about that. Um, um, with the Mexica, it's very clear the ways in which it expanded and the way in which it actually its market grew and, and the, the different tiers um, of society that they were principally focused on essentially ingesting politically the, the, the landscape, literally. I mean, like the political landscape that surrounded them. Um, and this was something that they, they recognized in their pilgrimage. One a, a chapter in this book that I've um, edited, it's called Political Landscape of Capital Cities, specifically talks about that and how that pilgrimage, which we know where they left Aslan and they made their way into the Central Valley of Mexico, it was actually pivotal in their vision of sort of seeing this much broader kind of, you know, incorporation of many, many different other people. So, of course, that's not to say, and this is very important, that, you know, that the Mishtek were not aware that there were these other many people. Of course they were. They were at many, many different exchanges with the Gulf Coast and with many other places. But the Mexica are the first to really kind of focus on the entire dominating of, I mean, whereas the, Mish the, the Mishtek and, the, you know, and the Washtek were basically in this long distance kind of uh, political and economic exchange. But the, the Mexica were the ones who wanted to dominate it. And I think it's precisely the reason why it is that they focus so much on creating an international language that then will allow them to, you know, incorporate much easier. It, you know, understanding that um, allows us to begin to gain a little bit of a deeper perspective um, about even the conquest. Right, because the Mexica are constantly negotiating these kinds of the, the, the political network. And it, is, it isn't until the Spanish arrive, but then they start presenting new alternative kind of contracts, so to speak. And it's part of the reason why it is that the Mexica begin to erode in that, in, in that is to say their political kind of, you know, machinery begins to erode because they're now being contested by people who are actually now running to create different rebellions. And, Conquest, I see it a lot more as a, as a rebellion than an actual kind of supreme, supreme kind of conquest of the, the, the Spain to Mexico. I think that the Spanish benefited greatly from the, the, the internal tumult, which was actually also part of what led the Mexica to really to the pinnacle to become, you know, the, the emperors, the, the empire that they were. So it's interrelated. Yeah. Yeah, following up with, with this, it's very interesting to learn all these complexities. And there has been since since 92, when the 500 years of the encounter of, of the, the two worlds, it has there been all this discussion and how the Mexica Empire was crumbled precisely because it had been or there had been other groups that had been conquered by them and that facilitated the Spaniards to do the, the own conquest. So next year it will be the 500 years of, of Encounter between the Spanish and the, the Mexicas. Yeah, you'll tell us more about it. it of the fall of uh, tell us as an architect of political power in the public space, it, as compared to the Spanish. It, we have heard many times that the Spaniards came and they just overlap their own power on top of the Mexica structure. Did that happen also in terms of urbanism and the, the, the we see Templo Mayor that is next to the or in front of the cathedral and or between the cathedral and, and Palacio Nacional. What can you tell us about these two worlds and what we inherited. Okay, you broke up a little bit. I don't know if it was just me or if it happened, but I, I think I got the, the, the gist. And 
Um, and, and if I, I don't get to all of the, the part of the, the question, please from, you know, ask it again. But um, the, the superimposition that happens, you know, and, and actually complete wipeout of, um, of the Mexica Templo Mayor and, and actually Tenochtitlan in general, it's something of a, it, that's been, you know, that has a lot of debate. There's a really wonderful book by Barbara Mundi um, that was just uh, published a few years ago. Now it's, I think it might be four, maybe even possibly five years ago, which is called The, the, um, the Death of Tenochtitlan and the Birth of Mexico, Mexico City. Um, and um, what we know actually, so about the various different trends, I, I actually think, can be understood in terms of the architectural legacy that is left behind. And that is right now, um, if we, even before speaking about Mexico City, the periphery. And so, as I mentioned, I, I wrote um, a, a thesis on the open chapels of, of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the thing that is amazing about those chapels is of course that they are built all outside of the capital many right immediately, right um, as soon as um, conquest, well actually within 20, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, and so uh, what is remarkable about that is of course, that many of those structures are built right over indigenous temples and they're built with many of the same stones, right? And that's not the case at the Temple Mayor because the Catedral Metropolitana is actually just off to the side of it, but very, very close. Um, we know very well that, of course, it makes perfect sense that a lot of the stone was used for refurbishing and rebuilding a lot of the Spanish structures. And we know that that is the case, certainly, with a lot of the 16th century monasteries. Um, but there, what's really fascinating about it is that, um, and this goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about the, the sort of the, 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 the rivalry that was taking place between the ways in which, you know, um, for instance, the, the span, the, there is a, an ethno-historic narrative by Diego Duran in, in the history, which he writes about how um, the Mexica, when they wanted to build a larger Templo Mayor, they asked for materials from all of their constituencies. And so what they did was that people, all of their subjects turned in material. And that what they did, and as you can imagine, this is almost, you know, impossible. they basically were supervised in the construction by four different lords from different parts, which emphasized the idea of totality because four for the Mexica were a symbol of, you know, the four corners plus the center. And they were always at the center, right? They believed that the whole world was sort of divided into quarters. And what is interesting about that is that essentially every construction project gave them the opportunity to emphasize the idea of the plural, the plurality, right? The ways in which all of it was, was being built. So not at all surprising when the Spanish arrived. And that is something that is fundamental with all, I think, pre-Hispanic cultures. Um, they immediately want to build churches because they want to build churches that are bigger than the Temple Mayor, because now the Temple Mayor is leveled, right? And so you end up having, I mean, you go today to somewhere like, you know, um, El Paso Yucan, out in the middle, you know, in, in Morelos, or you go to something like, you know, um, Huesotzinco, which is, I mean, the, 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 the church there is spectacular. It's actually built over, you know, a pre-Hispanic platform. But it's very, very clear that the indigenous people there, of course, wanted to build it because they wanted to now show that they were, you know, um, that they were now players, so to speak, political players, that they had, you know, they, 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 they were interested in now how they could go ahead and actually advance their own interests in this new kind of system. In, in, and so um, it's very fascinating to see the many, many different ways by which many of the of, of much labor is mobilized, um, and especially in relationship to you know uh, downtown Mexico City. As I was mentioning, um, the there is a little bit of a of a parallel in the way in which the the Palacio de Ayuntamiento, right, what is Cortez's palace, is a surrogate. It becomes literally for like you know a the ruling in absentia. It's a representation of the king, so to speak, right? The the, the actual building was a surrogate of Charles V, and in fact. It's one of the reasons why it is that when a, a portrait of Charles V is, comes to Mexico on its way to Manila, is actually kept, which is, a, unfortunately it's destroyed, but it, it was a, a faithful rendition of um, a copy of the wonderful painter, painting by Titian that's in the Prado today, which shows uh, 
Charles V on horseback. So the reason why it stayed there was because the building itself represented the king, so to speak. It's interesting when you then understand that that's the same parallel that existed with the Mexica in many ways. The, the Templo Mayor was a manifestation of essentially um, of, of, of many religious precepts. It also was a manifestation of, of, of sovereignty. It was the most important civic religious building. And so for instance, as I was mentioning, it's, it's fascinating um, in, in the ways in which the construction of it was done with a wide variety of materials. Um, different colors to basically emphasize the idea almost like a potpourri, which interestingly enough, of course, from a visual perspective, it emphasizes the idea of plurality of many different subjects and many people. And then what's fascinating about it is that the way by which they would always finish every, every face of the Templo Mayor was they would cover it with a single unifying coat of plaster, which then was the way by which it unified, basically coalesced. And then once that was done, they would then start the next phase of construction, which would then again be getting all those structures. So the, the building that itself- was every, That was every 52 years or not necessarily? Oh, no, no, no. It was, in, for the case of the Mexica, it's, it's right now, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma has pretty much established that uh, the, the phases of construction of the Temple Mayor tied directly with each of the uh, emperors. So as, uh, you know, what the death of every new emperor would be the beginning of another construction. Though I will also say, it, Leonardo Lopez Lujan has shown that, um, you know, there are as much as Matos identified first, you know, seven overall phases and six kind of short phases. Leonardo Lopez Lujan has shown that there's, you know, many, 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 many more. And that this, this project of building the Templo Mayor was never ending, was continuous. That was something that they, they repeatedly ended up being focused on. And I, pers I, I think that makes perfect sense for the ways in which essentially the empire was growing. They had to continue to make the adjustments that would then end up emphasizing the, the, the different modes by which they were dominating the landscape, right? So as the, literally as the landscape it, it, or the, the political terrain that, that the Mexica dominated grew, so did the Templo Mayor. And so that's, the, and it's also, it's amazing because of course they never, um, they never just built it and then decided to build next to it. They continued to build on that same one place. So that emphasizes the idea of the centrality, the importance, the cosmic axis, which is what, you know, the work of Eduardo Matos Moctezuma and Leonardo Lopez Lucan and Alfredo Lopez Austin has done marvels at being able to explicitly kind of, you know, amplify the different ways by which that one understands that. Great. Barbara? And if we could now turn to the other type of work that you do related to museums. Um, I'd like to know, in your opinion, how does the general public learn better and learn more when we visit a museum? Like, for example, and you see a number of archaeological pieces displayed there. I'm thinking of, for example, when you contributed to the design and museography of the Museo Arqueológico of the Olmec site of La Venta in Mexico in the 90s. Mm -hmm. What was your experience then and about how to make visitors have a really enriching and illustrating experience of this and if this is possible to apply to a North American audience? Yeah, I mean, with, within confines, it's a, you know, regretfully, <laughs> I've not um, yet been able to have the privilege of curating um, an exhibition on Mexica sculpture, but I am working on, on changing that. I'm hoping that that might change. Um, but so the, the issue with museums is that they allow um, the opportunity to see objects in relationship to one, to one another. Oftentimes, of course, be bringing items, if it's a special exhibition, it's, it's allowing you to put things back together that may, may have been fragmented over time, whether it is, um, you know, because objects have been removed and, and sold and, and, and trafficked, or because, you know, at one point, objects, and, and this was part of the exhibition that I was working on, you know, that were given as, as, as a unit and then were broken up and kind of dispersed. And so museums allow for that opportunity um, to, to be able to illustrate curated narratives, right? The, the curating narratives. With La Venta, as you mentioned, um, La Venta, the only site of La Venta was a particularly important uh, um, opportunity for me where I worked closely with uh, the, the principal investigator there, Rebecca Gonzalez Lau. Um, she was in the process of revamping the museum and we had lots of conversations and 
um, the, the, um, we discussed the different ways by which that museum could recreate the monumentality of the site because I'm not sure how many of your viewers have ever been or if you have been, but it's, it's a spectacular site. And it's, it's, it, it isn't until you step into it that you then realize that we, the awesome power of the Olmec and being able to kind of move the landscape quite literally and, and create this spectacular tableau. Um, and so um, what we did was we, we talked about various different ways by which we could emphasize the monumentality. And there had been a series of sculptures, three specifically, that she had discovered in one side of the site that hadn't been excavated. There were these three massive columns of basalt that were um, very clear from the, her excavations that these would have been standing up and possibly maybe even like a gateway, a portal. Um, and so what we did um, was we, um, I worked closely with her to bring those into the exhibition space so that that would be the first thing that the viewer got a chance to see. So when you'd walk in, you would be dwarfed by this magnificence. Um, and that's, uh, that's really important. Uh, of course, you know, it's not at all surprising that my focus tends to be so heavily on spatial compositions because I feel that that is, and it's especially the case, I think it's especially relevant to pre-Columbian cultures um, uh, because it isn't until you actually step at the site that you're able to see things in much, in the plenitude. Um, you know, of course, exhibitions in the US often lack that important spatial references. And instead they center on the contextualization of objects through didactic labels and the presentation of objects and in, in, through photographs and various different things. It's understandable. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's shy of, of, of not being there. Um, so for instance, I can give you two examples of exhibitions on the Mexica. One was at the um, uh, Academy of Art in London, I believe it was in 2003, 2004. Um, it was a spectacular exhibition which had an incredible array. Like it was, it was, um, it was the first comprehensive exhibition of Aztec art. And so as a result, because they, it hadn't been done in years, they were able to get, you know, practically everything but the Guatlique way. I mean, I was, we were surprised when, when I went, I mean, my mouth just dropped as, as to just what a spectacular collection. And of course, because it was in London, it managed to get also a lot of objects from both the British Museum and from many, many other European collections, which was, Amazing. The problem was that, of course, um, the, especially in the case of the Mexica, they, you know, so much of their work is either monumental or it's also very exquisitely kind of, you know, smaller objects. And so um, because of the nature of the curation, um, you know, a lot of massive objects were, were grouped with smaller ones, which is understandable in terms of, of presenting a, a, a curated theme, but it really kind of distorted the, the, the larger kind of um, ways in which the Mexica kind of viewed their world, right? Because it almost kind of placed them within these very confined categories. Um, and it, my experience with the Mexica has been that they, as, as much as there were certainly rules, they constantly kind of, you know, um, blurred divisions between them. They did create a superstructure of essentially, you know, these various different gods, but each god would continue to grow as, of course, the empire grew. And so the complexity and the iconographic elements constantly were in flux. Alfredo Lopez Austin has wrote this marvelous essay in the 70s um, that was um, about precisely what he termed as the, as the um, you know, this, this sort of never ending kind of, um, uh, God, and I can't remember now the, the exact title of it, but it, it's related to the ways in which you know, gods were repeatedly kind of refashioned by the Mexica to incorporate because of the political growth that, that, was, that was happening. Um, and so, um, you know, in the case, let me give you a different example, and that is to say with, you know, of another exhibition that was actually at the United States at the Guggenheim Museum, but they also ended up getting a lot of really amazing sculptures. The big problem was Again, the close proximity of sculptures and the way in which, unfortunately, many of them were pressed up against the walls. And you can't really see that. I mean, um, in some ways, the National Museum of Anthropology, the Sala Mexica, is one of the most wonderful spaces to see it. A, because it's two and a half, three stories high. And so you have this incredible vertical space. 
and, and which really kind of gives you a sense of the monumentality of the works. And also because most, there's very, very few works that you actually can't walk around entirely to the back to see them. And, you know, I mean, the Mexica sculpted even the, the bottom of it, the Cuatlicue has these amazing kind of Cuatlicue figures underneath. And they're, it's not the only one, there, there are many, many others. So there is that kind of, um, you know, limitation in terms of how one can present. And, and unfortunately, um, it, I actually do think it, it, it sells the aesthetic value of these works short. Because, um, I mean, I admire, of course, the interest in wanting to show as much as you can. But in doing that, it, it actually, I think it backfires. It, it forces you to, to it, it kind of tires you out visually. Because let's face it, um, one of the things that the Mexica knew very well was to really attack you, you know, psychologically. I mean, the works were precisely done to, to kind of, you know, attack you. I mean, it's, it's also one of the reasons why it is that I, I so love reading, you know, um, uh, Bernal Diaz de Cortes and Bernal Diaz de Castillo um, and Cortes, in which they, they actually do talk about the ways in which the, the soldiers, these, these really hard soldiers, were shocked to see these works. And, you know, it's like there's actually one reference that said, you know, even one of the soldiers, you know, soiled himself because he was just sort of like scared. Um, and in fact, in, in, in Molina, it's, it's marvelous. So Molina is, is you know, um, um, the Spanish friar who writes a vocabulary of Nahuatl. And in there, if you look under um, and Frighten, you know, you will find, you know, to be frightened, to, to, to have the shit frightened out of you, to be frightened and white, to be frightened. <laughs> and so these were all phrases that the Mexica were kind of like, okay, so this sculpture has to frighten you to the point where you defecate. You know, like, <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing. And it is, I mean, every time I, I mean, I know this monument so well, but I can't help but every time I, I go to the National Museum of Anthropology and stand before the Cuatlicue, to just be like, wow, you know, I have to hold my breath. It's just the, the, the magnitude, the power of it is just palpable. Yeah. Well, I was happy to read today that the museum is opening tomorrow. It had been closed during all the pandemia and it is opening tomorrow. So let's go. One of, yeah. So uh, you've been working the last many months uh, in an ex what I find an extraordinary exhibit that was to be displayed at Boston's, Boston's MFA next year. Uh, it, for many reasons, it was suspended. But you were trying to draw parallels between the Habsburg Empire and the Mexica Empire and how they used, let's say, uh, cultural diplomacy to show others how important they were. Can you tell us a little bit about this project? Sure, I'd be delighted to. I mean, you're generous to refer to the exhibit as the, that I was working on as extraordinary. I actually believe it was, and so I'm thrilled that you also uh, thought so in the conversations that we had. Um, and I must actually say that a, a lot of my fellow curators and scholars throughout the US, Europe, but especially in Mexico and Spain, Austria, UK, um, and in Italy, um, generously welcomed me and, and supported this project, which I was, you know, uh, you know, 16 months away from, or actually not even 16 months, I, almost a year away from being able to complete. Um, it grew out of an interest to commemorate the 500 year encounter. Um, and, and the, the fatalistic material exchange between Cortes and the Mexica Emperor Mothic um, and the eventual fall of the great indigenous capital of Mexico, Tenochtitlan. What I wanted to do was just precisely as you had said, I wanted to reframe the narrative um, of this first encounter and of precisely of, of you know, what happens then um, that is between Europe and, and the mainland, shifting the language from any singular discussion of conquest and destruction, which seems to always present us as, you know, victims, and that that was it. And, and, and it also creates a situation where it always places Mote Kutsoma as someone who just it really kind of misjudged and made a lot of, you know, political mistakes, which I, I don't particularly necessarily agree. I mean, the circumstances were, were amazing. I mean, if you just think about, you know, these, these people who've now showed up at your door, you know, have essentially just fallen out of the sky. There are narratives, of course, that talk about that, 
mostly in the post-conquest. And it's very clear. I mean, this is one of the things that I, I loved about um, being a student of James Lockhart. That he very clearly established amongst uh, his students um, how, you know, um, essentially um, the, the, the many different narratives that were created were created precisely to now advance the political interests in the colonial period of those people from the house of Moctezuma and um, of Moctezuma and, and Ixochitl and the various many other elites to try and gain better, firmer ground. So in that, um, you know, um, the, the exhibition that I was working on, um, I was interested in, 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 center, in centering it around presenting some of the objects from that moment of contact when these two civilizations met through the two surrogates. Um, that is to say the one being Cortes and then also the other being a Mexica emissary who got sent. Um, it, it showcased, it was supposed to showcase the spectacular objects that were unearthed from the um, archaeologists from the Templo Mayor offerings um, that were excavated 40 years, 42 years ago um, um, in, through the Proyecto Templo Mayor, uh, uh, let's see, the Proyecto Templo Mayor, right, exactly, which was headed by Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, which created in 1978. Um, and, you know, um, the current, um, uh, the, the current uh, principal um, uh, uh, excavator at the Templo Mayor, Leonardo Lopezujan, has authored and supervised a, a, you know, a bounty of publications and the remarkable finds of the many projects he has headed. <clears throat> and most recently, um, he's laid out you know, um, the richness of, um, and we'll, he's always laid out the richness of the Mexica offerings and their I ideological importance as cosmograms. Um, I, in this exhibition, wanted to emphasize the material presence of these offerings and focus on them as, as, on the, as dazzling collections, that is to say, of the Mexica universe that the Mexica possessed. That is to say, I, I wanted to interpret each of these offerings as literally a curated exhibition um, um, that, that included a bounty of raw materials, flora, fauna, exquisite objects that rendered a political map of the Mexica. Um, uh, control and that they territory. came from all over Mesoamerica, all, the, right. all the territories conquered by them. That is, that is exactly right. I mean, that is, in, in fact, it's, it's one of the prevalent themes that almost every offering really goes to extreme lengths to, to emphasize the, 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 what the we now would call an, an encyclopedic vision, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but it, and it's amazing to think that they are that aware, I mean, in, in the sense of both in terms of territory, but then also in terms of wanting to possess it. I mean, and there's, you know, there's conversations about precisely, you know, how Monte um, uh, uh zoo, which Leonardo mostly refers to viveros because they were basically containing or collecting items mostly for them being able to then deposit them, um, you know, in, into the ritual deposits. But then also the aviary, and then we also know that he had this 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 amazing garden right in Cuernavaca, where he wanted to have one of every, like basically every single plant in the whole universe. This is something that is really interesting, and that's the parallel that I was wanting to play. That you know, it's the kind of thing that we normally attribute to European kings. We never actually attribute to indigenous kings, and it's amazing how visionary um, you know Montezuma was in that way. And um, there's actually a book that was just written, um, well, last year by, um, <coughs> um, gosh, and I've just drawn a blank, uh, Matthew, um, when Montezuma met Cortes, and I'm trying to remember, he was also a student of, um, goodness, uh, Matthew Restall. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about that. Um, he's a student of, of James Lockhart as well. Though he principally worked in the Maya, he's now shifted his focus in the last, 10, 15 years on, on Mexica studies. But one chapter specifically talks precisely about the ways in which Motecuzoma was actually a collector. Um, and this was something that I was really, really focusing on. You know, um, I, I was interpreting, as I said, that these offerings as curated exhibitions and that these were in essence short-lived temporal exhibitions that were a manifestation of the constructed Mexica universe. And in this, you know, as I said, they were really not very different from the princely collections that were being amassed in Europe. Um, specifically, the materials that I, uh, that I was uh, interested in were uh, those that came in that first encounter. Um, 
through emissaries and the objects that were you know, received by Cortes and then forwarded to the Spanish King Charles I, exactly at the point in time in 1519, when he was becoming the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Um, and Charles carried these, and this is what's amazing about this, this narrative that I was actually laying out. And uh, it's known, but um, it, the way in which the exhibition was really kind of privileged this, was you know, these objects were received and Charles took them to the house in Brussels where his aunt, the Duchess of Savoy, Margaret of Austria, recognized you know, the, the spectacular brilliance of these materials. And it's, it's interesting because we often get you know, the conversation that the Spanish and Europeans basically just completely destroyed everything, but that wasn't the case. Um, and um, what is particularly interesting is that Margaret recognized the value the political value that she would have and that Charles V would have as the Holy Roman Emperors to show these materials to all essentially who would come. And they had an exhibition of three days. And what's fascinating is that Albrecht Dürer, you know, this incredible European artist comes and he actually, uh, he attended the, the exhibition and he famously writes about the brilliance of men of foreign lands who made this, right? Um, it's, it's, it, it's also interesting because it is Charles' younger brother, who is Ferdinand I, who receives some of these gifts. Charles V gives him some of these items from, that he's received from Mexico specifically. And he covets them and he values them so highly that he puts them in, in, in you know, along with many, many other items that he has, he has collected from, you know, from um, their, their um, treasures, um, that is to say the Hofburg treasures that he creates um, a collection basically and stores it in a room which he labels Kunstkammer in 1532. And Kunstkammer is essentially the forerunner of modern day museums today. And it's interesting how you know, the pivotal role that Mexica art plays in that kind of understanding this, this, this aesthetics and, and, and kind of collection. So the exhibition that I was hoping to, to or that I'm still hoping to be able to put together was culminating um, in, in presenting an incredible array of objects that were created during the 16th and early 17th century. These spectacular feather mosaics, you know, composite objects that um, are both made in Europe and then also Mexico, and even paintings, and actually even some composite objects that were made also, interestingly enough, by the Mexica before the arrival of Europeans to show that they also were thinking the same. I mean, I'm thinking in this case of the spectacular, um, you know, uh, uh, dressed up, uh, knives, I'm not sure if you've seen them, which have a wig of a monkey and have a hairdress of gold and, and various other jewels, that when you see them, I mean, it's, it's just shocking, but it's this amazing way in which the Mexica were kind of bringing in all of these various different, you know, elements together and, and creating these fantastic objects, which were representation of gods and various different other things. Um, but, you know, the reality of that is, is, you know, I'm still continuing to find a venue for the exhibition. Um, and, but it has to be reconfigured, reconfigured now to fit the new realities that the museums face as a result of the financial impacts of COVID and the social reckoning, reckoning of you know, colonialism that we're currently you know, undergoing. Um, I, I do take every opportunity I can to try to continue to refine um, the exhibition to fit this new reality. And I'm definitely excited about the opportunities that this may have to offer. You know, I'll be more than delighted to let you know when I when I've um, made some headway in this though. When, and maybe you should, uh, well, if it had been, uh, if, if it had not been uh, postponed or, or suspended, maybe right now you would be suffering a lot because maybe you would have not been able to show it anyway because of COVID. Right. But, but it would be interesting to, that you continue talking with Leonardo uh, because maybe it could be, in, in Templo Mayor, one of the, uh, and then from there moving it to, to other places. LACMA yeah. loves doing things together. And, but I mean, we could be three days or several months uh, talking about this. Uh, right, exactly. You, you, you propose many elements of how the juxtaposition of the two cultures the how the syncretism of Mexican culture became. But I, I loved uh, something that you mentioned, the, the urge to de-victimize uh, 
the, the Mexica. It, it was a, an encounter of different cultures, but they also, after the, the, the fight, they were able through learning Spanish and writing and interpreting the codex, they were able to negotiate right. uh, yeah, well, I mean, their position. Right, I mean, and that's the thing that's most amazing about the works that survived from the colonial period, that they very clearly, I mean, I always tell this to my students, of course, it helps that I teach at an art school, but, you know, I always tell them that art is rebellion. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to have actually fought valiantly the way in which the Mexica did to the very last men and to hold, you know, to hold basically Tenochtitlan the way in which they did it. And, and that's one of the reasons why the city is actually leveled, right? Because they are not willing to give this up. Really clearly establishing and showing you, I mean, it's like it's a six month onslaught, you know, I mean, or, or uh, not six months, but four months. But it, what's interesting about this is that it's, it very clearly establishes that the Mexica were always looking for other alternative ways by which they could advance their interest in art clearly establishes that in the colonial period. I mean, it's very, very, very clear that a lot of the materials that are, a lot of the spectacular objects that are being made are precisely being made because they are, but small negotiations in the larger kind of vision of the way in which they are going to basically promote themselves and, and, and find that, you know, alternate realities. I mean, and it's, it's one of those things where um, also Donna Pierce um, in this wonderful book that she wrote, um, which is called, um, uh, painting Latin America, I mean, painting a new world. She talks about the differences that exist between the ways in which, you know, um, uh, New England and, and you know, um, the Eastern coast of the United States was colonized in relationship to Mexico. And how, um, you know, it's not to say that this, and, and this is very important, you know, the hor horrors that were brought on and unleashed on Mexico are not, you know, are unexcusable. But, um, but it is important to understand that there were many different ways by which people chose to basically counter. Some people fought to the very end, others decided to negotiate in various different ways. Um, and, and that's where you do get this then, this continual kind of amazing, you know, fluorescence of, of culture. Um, it, it's certainly nothing compared to what, you know, some of the things that were happening, but, but it's a mutation, it's a different kind of you know, life, it's a different kind of order that ends up happening. And I mean, um, and, it, and it was also the, the Spaniards encounter of a civilization and right. a very strong one. That is exactly which, right. Which is not what happened up here. But that's, we, that's right. we, I think we better start thinking looking in a series of conversations for next year with different uh, guests that we could do together because really the, the theme is, is fantastic. And, and there are lots of, of uh, academics like you around here that we could invite to give us different perspectives on, on this encounter. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And for, I mean, it, it's been almost an hour and it went like in, in 10 minutes. I don't know if you want to add something or Barbara, uh, just to close up. No, please go ahead. I'd love to hear some, some closing thoughts on, on all of this and, 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 and what we're commemorating next year. Well, I think that the, the, for me, certainly, um, one of the things that is most important to commemorate is, is precisely the, this ongoing struggle. And it was, I mean, even to the point at which the, the arrival of the Spanish, you know, took place, um, the, the, the Mexica Empire was, you know, essentially a, you know, a work in progress. It was continued, I mean, and that's what you see in, in the repeated kind of building of the Temple Mayor and various different other things. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things, just as I said earlier, um, to think of victimization or to think of them as only victims is selling them short, is selling them, um, it's, it's not really rendering them the honor that they deserve for, for having fought to the very last, you know, and when they could, for then readapting many of them, you know, the, the different parts, because of course, I mean, even in terms of me, I'm, I'm of, not, um, of Otomi descent, you know, and so for me, 
uh, as much as, and ironically, you know, I studied Nahuatl with, um, with James Lockhart. I didn't, I, I didn't learn Otomi because of course I grew up in kind of a repressive Mexico where of course the worst thing we could, you know, you could say was to actually in school have someone tell you where you're going to speak in, in Otomi, right? And so well, the interesting thing about it is that I don't see the Spanish as liberators. Of course, I never would do that. But I, but I see as sort of like the opportunities that were given to then for other you know, indigenous groups to basically be able to reinvent themselves and reconvene themselves in, in this long kind of unending process of culture, which Mexico has excelled at. I mean, I, 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 one of the things that has been so amazing for me is, you know, whenever I travel to Mexico, how much I always find um, those very, very same interests that fit the academic discourse in every exchange that I have with every meal that I have with every person that I meet because it's, 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 it's a, a very rich culture full of this, this amazing kind of historical, you know, um, depth, which I think is, is, is uh, wonderful to always celebrate. And, you know, yeah, let's go to the Museum of Anthropology. <laughs> Okay, you know, and, and, and let's have this series of conversations next year. You know? That would be wonderful. Let's think about it. That would well, be great. Thank you so much. And thank you all for, for taking the time to follow us. As you know, we will be ending our, this series of conversations for this year next Tuesday. Uh, please follow us. And if you haven't seen, there's always very easy to see them through the in the Facebook uh, page of the Mexican Consulate in Boston. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. For this wonderful uh, invitation.